All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome to today's Road Reflection. Thank you for tuning in to this episode, these uh, virtually daily videos that I am going to be making. Hello, I am uh, Krish Mohan. I'm wearing a hat. I'm wearing a hat. Got uh, Got to point that out. Uh, and uh, the reason for the hat is because my uh, got out of the shower hair's very poofy. It's just uh, it's just a bag of poof right now. Uh, so decided to contain it within the hat uh, in hopes that uh, that it just doesn't like the whole screen just doesn't become my hat uh, my hair. You know that's the that's the concern right there, people is is uh, the level of poof it'll just over it'll consume the whole screen and then you know and then it's just you're 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 just looking at cousin it from the adams family the whole time right is that is that who it is, is with the hair the, or no cousin it, is that the hand correct me if i'm wrong i don't i don't i don't know I, I made the reference, and now I'm not confident whether that uh, <clears throat> is an accurate reference or not. Uh, but we got uh, we got some stories uh, for you guys today. We got four that I, I was originally not going to do the first story that I um, <laughs> wound up queuing up, but uh, I feel like I feel like I got to talk about it. But we'll get to that in just a second. Doing a quick check in at the top of the show. I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Uh, some of you might have seen my post from earlier today. I got my sunglasses out of my car. Yeah, these bad boys. They're prescription sunglasses. Uh, they have prescription lenses in them. Um, and I have to wear them the second half of the day. Uh, because as it turns out, um, uh, my eyes start hurting. Because I think I'm straining my eyeballs by staring into a screen for uh the better part of the day because i'm doing more research for these shows i'm also doing uh social media pretty regularly um trying to keep up and like promoting these videos and getting them out there um and then i'm also trying to um you know do more research and writing for forkful stuff so it uh it it, it definitely has a strain uh, on the old, uh, the old eyeballs, the old window to the souls. So, um, aside from, I, mean, I think that's kind of what ca ended up causing my migraine the other day and is, and it kind of like has been made it a little bit more difficult the last few days to do stuff. So it's, it's, it's a good kind of note to bear in mind. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, a little, little precaution, um, to, to add uh, to 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 my daily routine now that's that's the new normal that's the new normal that I'm facing right now so uh, I think uh, I think we should jump right into it let's jump right into it let's let's start with story number one I have um, I have made this argument before uh, but uh, because of some recent news I uh, you know, I feel like I have to make this argument again. The argument being that the status quo will not save us. And what do I mean by the status quo? Well, right now, the status quo for the, the, the political party that's in the minority, which is the Democrats, uh, status quo would be going to some other Democrat. That's not going to help. Uh, and really the reason why I'm even talking about this now is because of the Joe Rogan controversy uh, that we have returned to. We've returned to another fucking Joe Rogan controversy. <laughs> um, I listened to the clip. And some, someone posted about it. A couple, well, a couple people posted about it. Uh, claiming that he had said that he is going to vote for Trump. And I was like, well, that's kind of strange. Um, you know, and he said that he would vote for Trump over Biden, which would check out. Um, Joe Rogan voted for a libertarian in the last election. He, he talks about that pretty openly. 
uh, he wanted to support Tulsi Gabbard, and he said that he was in full support of Bernie Sanders as well. Uh, and if you remember back to 2016, after Hillary got into the nomination for the Democratic Party, uh, you know, there were a lot of people, and I met these people, and I had a hard time believing that these people existed as well, um, is there were a lot of people that were Bernie supporters that voted for Trump. It's a reality. That's p part of the part of the thing that, that we have to accept. Um, why do they do that? Uh, some of them just said, fuck it. The other people basically said that the Democratic Party doesn't have uh, any of their interests in mind, and they're not wrong. I don't think the Democratic Party has any of the working class people, immigrants, LGBTQ, any, any of these identities that are all part of the working class community. Um, they don't have their, the, uh, our interests in mind. They just don't. Historically speaking, you can, you can see that. Um, so now it's sort of this mad dash for the status quo so that people can go back to complacency. Right. Um, so that people can kind of go back to being like, oh, thank God, Democrats. And OK, all right. I don't have to pay attention to this shit anymore because it's so exhausting. Um, so uh, I basically made the comment that Trump and Biden are the same, which if you look at their record, if you look at who Joe Biden is as a person and who Donald Trump is as a person, they're virtually the same individual. They virtually have the same beliefs. They virtually have the same policies. Uh, the treatment of people is virtually the same, um, you know. And and th and this is sort of the problem with Joe Biden. And it's it's kind of the same reason why uh, Rogan said that he's not going to vote for Biden. Is first of all, um, Joe Ro Joe Rogan said brought up in in that podcast that. Uh, Biden's mental health is in severe decline, which it is, but Bi Biden's cognitive health is in severe decline, and uh, and it 100% is. It, it definitely is in severe decline. I think everybody knows this. Everybody can see it, um, and if you want somebody that has uh, a... The question really should be is, do you think the leader of the free world, whether you think Joe Biden is going to win or not... Do you think that they should have a severe cognitive deficiency? I mean, to me, the answer is very clear and easy, which is uh, no, no, you shouldn't. I think you should kind of be sharp. You should kind of know what the fuck you're saying. You should kind of be able to put together uh, coherent full sentences and you should be able to put together thoughts. Um, you should be able to come up with plans and stay and stick with them. Um, you know, but look at the way that Joe Biden treats women. Uh, you could see the, you could see, uh, see, you could see that in in the in the uh, Anita Hill deposition, and how badly he treated her during that. You, Tara Reid came out and said that he straight up sexually assaulted her. Right? I mean, isn't that one of the big things about Trump that that that, that these Democrats don't like? Is that uh, is that he's 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 a, a sexual abuser? He's a sexual assaulter. That he's like basically raped women. Like, and that's basically what Joe Biden did is rape a lady. Like, that's and it's out there. Corporate media won't touch it. You know. So, uh, so there's that. Uh, he's a trickle down economics guy. He basically said that he, he straight up said that he would veto Medicare for all. Straight up said that he would veto Medicare for all. He also basically said that the way that we should deal with this uh, global pandemic that we are in is by letting the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry do what it needs to do, which is make money off of it, which is basically how they deal with these problems, right? And now you have Trump, who is enacting his version of Medicare for all, uh, with the with the CARES Act, I believe is what it's called, uh, where he's he's basically saying that he's going to um, he's going to give people that are just go to the hospital and get tested and it'll be covered as a Medicare for all thing. The hospitals will be paid as a Medicare by under Medicare rates. So just go 
Don't worry about the paperwork. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Get tested, get better, and, and move on and get back to your life. That's, that's Trump's plan right now. Um, Biden said he would veto Medicare for all. Biden hasn't come up with a plan. Biden hasn't done a goddamn thing. On a live stream, there's a clip uh, that I watched this morning of Biden talking to a couple in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and, and the, the woman had uh, contracted the virus and is wearing a mask so that she doesn't infect her um, child and husband, who's a freelancer. And she asks him, hey, when, when things get bad and our savings are depleted, which they will be, which, uh, which do you think we should give up first? Food, rent, or health insurance? And he goes, don't give up anything. <laughs> That's not how it works, Joey. Uh, people don't have an infinite reserve of cash. Uh, and, and you're not for, the, for any sort of reserves of cash at all. You know, like, look, the, the, the $1,200 stimulus bill is, is not going to help anybody. I mean, it's a very short-term plan at best. But again... Tell me how what Joe Biden is doing is better than what Trump is doing. I don't think there is an answer to that. Joe Biden is an arrogant human being that will not apologize for what he's done in the past. Neither will Trump. Joe Biden has talked down to reporters that challenge him uh, about his stances on climate change, on his stances on health care, on his stances on the military, on his stances on race uh, issues, and his record with working with segregationists. He will talk down to them. He'll scream at them. He'll go tell them to vote for somebody else. Trump does the same thing. So once again, please point out to me how Joe and Trump are vastly different And then the argument of, of fascism is brought into play, right? Which is like, it doesn't matter what party you're in. There's already fascistic things that are happening in this country that were enacted by Democrats. Still today, there are, are, there are things that, are, uh, that, that were enacted by Democrats that are in play. 1912, Woodrow Wilson was in, in, in office. He won that election. He put the Espionage Act in play. That act right now is going to be uh, used against a fucking journalist Let's go recently, right? Since we're talking about Joe Biden, let's talk about Barack Obama, since Joey B loves to bring up Barack Obama. <laughs> loves to bring up that dude, right? Barack Obama opened up uh, the surveillance program, um, revealed that the NSA is spying on everybody. Vault 7 leaks were happen Vault 7 leaks happened under Obama. Increased a drone program that killed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. That's part of Joe Biden's legacy that's that's i mean you, you telling me that spying on your citizens through technology is not fascistic telling telling me that uh in increasing uh military activities across the globe just because we fucking want to is not fascistic and that's all done under both democrats and republicans but for these vote any blue kind of people well the only time that it matters is when a Republican does it. <laughs> when they come knock down my doors. Yeah, that threat has been a reality for 22 fucking years. And that threat hasn't changed just because I got my citizenship, by the way. What I believe in is a threat to the establishment. What I'm saying and how I say it, using comedy as my vehicle to bring people together is a threat to the establishment. And regardless of who's in office, that has never changed. Barack Obama deported more immigrants than the last three presidents combined. I was an immigrant under Barack Obama, which means that I was under threat under Barack Obama. The Republicans screwed me over, the Democrats screwed me over. Same, I mean, that's, this, is a, this is the truth for millions and millions of other people. Joe Biden and Trump are no different than each other. And Joe Biden has virtually no chance to stand up against that Adderall-ridden human being because he is Adderall-ridden. 
if you're going to sit there and vote shame people now, by the way, you're, you're going to vote shame people in the middle of a, in, in the middle of a global pandemic where we don't even know what November's going to look like at this point. I mean, you're guaranteeing that progressives who are already pissed, who are already disillusioned, who who are already like in in a state of burn everything to the ground. Let's figure out how to exit the party. Let's figure out how to create our own thing. Let's figure out how to maybe create a proxy government or some shit. You're going to sit there and vote shame them. And that's your plan. Who I vote for is my business. I don't have to tell you who I voted for. And quite frankly, I'm not going to make that decision until probably November 8th before I have to push the fucking button. That's really when I'll make the decision. And whether I choose to or not is my right. It's, it's my right to exercise, not yours. So shitting on me for who I vote for or who, if I choose to vote at all is doing what? For your cause, which your cause seems to be lining up with a party that doesn't represent you and hasn't represented you for 20, 30 odd years. And the argument of privilege gets brought into play, right? Like I, I get called privileged or whatever. And it's just like, what, how is this an argument? I'm privileged because I want to change a system that's not working for anybody. I am a broke fucking artist right now <laughs> and have been. I've been broke most of my life. I'm a broke immigrant that just became a citizen I'm an artist. I'm a blue collar working artist that tours around the country talking about basically socialist ideologies that will never be on any sort of major television network, that will never be on Netflix or anything, and has no desire for fame. But somehow that makes, that gives the, me a point of privilege of, of some kind. Has never, that argument has never made any sense to me. Really, what, what, Joe Rogan has brought up as an argument that myself, Lee Camp, Eleanor Goldfield, Kid Cabello at, at Hardlands Media, and J uh, Jimmy Dore, Ron Placone, Graham Elwood, Kim Iverson, I mean, the list goes on, have been talking about for years now, is that this is a systemic problem, that the Democratic Party doesn't give a shit about you, and it doesn't matter what party is in power. The party represents a system. Both of them do. Both parties represent a system. The system doesn't work for you. And what we need is dynamic, radical, fundamental change in that system. And we shouldn't be wor being worried about an election during a fucking global pandemic where people are getting scared that they're going to have to choose between rent, food, and health insurance. And Joe Biden has no answer for any of that shit. The status quo will not and will never save you. So if you're an any blue will do kind of person that is, that is looking to, to go back into respite, to, to get some reprieve into, oh, I can lounge and not think about anything ever again. I can just, I can just let Joe Biden run the con. Ooh, ooh. My goodness, I've been using my brain too much. It, you know, if you want to go back to that, it's just not going to happen. We're done with complacency. That era is over. That era is over. Uh, I don't know what to tell you about electoral politics in this country. I don't. Uh, but I know that uh, my desire to participate in it came from two candidates, uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie Sanders. That was my desire to participate in the electoral process, in the voting process in this country. I don't see any other candidate that uh, has earned my vote, and that's what it should be. Uh, Joe Biden doesn't automatically get my vote because I have to register as a Democrat. And I'm not a Democrat, by the way. I'm not. I don't affiliate myself with that party. I have to register as one because this is a closed primary state. Pennsylvania is a closed primary state. But uh, think again if you think I am one. The status quo will not save you. We will save each other. We will help each other. But... Uh, 
the status quo will not save you. So you can vote any blue. I, I, I've made the decision in 2016 not to vote shame anybody for who they voted for. Um, I, will, I will discuss the reasons why uh, and why we have a disagreement in, in, in the choice of candidates. Um, I, will, I will try to have civil discourse with you, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you're a monster or what have you, so on and so forth, right? Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be here to listen to, 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 to you, to your issues, and what you, what you believe, uh, what ideas, philosophies uh, you believe in, and why you thought this candidate was going to represent that. That's more important. The ideas are more important. Joe Biden doesn't fucking matter. Donald Trump doesn't matter. And by the way, for, for saying that you won't vote for Joe Biden doesn't mean that it's an automatic, um, automatic expression to vote for Trump automatic support for Trump. That sort of binary thinking um, comes from this, this duopoly that we're in. This desperate need for, for just an, a, an additional point of view, an additional perspective that's needed. So we have to get beyond the status quo. We have to make a new status quo, a status quo that, that is actually progressive that that actually cares about the individuals that actually it, 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 that that puts corporations secondary not puts profit on the secondary that has that that values meaning and purpose and fulfillment and happiness and joy and and doing something that that is b bigger than just the the amount of money that's in your bank account the status quo will will not save you All right, we're moving on. I had to make that point again. I've made that point before, I know, but uh, but uh, but now with more b passion and a hat, uh, so so it's a little different. Uh, as you all know, I am um, maybe not all of you. Some some of you might know this. I am covering uh, strikes that we've seen over the last couple hundred years. Um, talking about them, talking about the pros and the cons and what we can get out of them, what worked about them, what didn't work about them, so on and so forth, right? Um, so in, in that light, today we are going to discuss the MLB strikes of 1972 and 1994. Uh, I am not a big sports person, by the way, um, but I figured this would be something important to cover because... Uh, we talk a lot about labor movements, so we talk a lot about, like, teachers and manufacturing workers and, like, grit blue-collar workers and white-collar workers, and that's usually what we think about with labor. Uh, but, you know, this is something a little bit different. This is slightly different than what, what we would normally normally um, correlate with a strike of sorts, right? So, in 1972, uh, the the... Major League Baseball Players Association, which had only been around for maybe six years, something like that, um, is is what I read, went on a 13-day strike, uh, particularly over their pensions. That's that's primarily what what they wanted. Now, the owners of the baseball teams um, did not expect the strike to happen, which is kind of on par, right? Like most of these stories, usually when this happens, the bosses, the managers, all these other fucking people are just like, we didn't even think. I mean. We took all their money and their rights and their humanity away from them. I mean, we didn't think anybody would have a problem with that to make us more rich. I mean, that's the price you got to pay. That's the price you got to pay to make me more rich. It's crazy. I can't even believe that this would happen. <laughs> Which, like, that's just how they react. They're just so surprised that people are standing up for their rights when you're stealing everything away from them. Uh, you know, like the 1877 railroad strikes, like they were literally like, we're going to cut people's pay and I bet you they'll be excited about it. People love being poor. People love it. It's their favorite thing in the world to struggle to find food, to struggle to make ends meet, to struggle to pay. They love it. It's like their favorite thing in the world to be poor. It gives them character. You know, we don't. The rich don't have character. The rich have uh, everything else. You know what you can't eat is uh, character. So, 
<laughs> so, uh, the strike wasn't expected for a couple different reasons, and this reason was talked about with the Players Association. Um, they hadn't been paid for from from the previous year. They hadn't been paid from the 1971 season when this happened. Um, so they didn't have a strike fund. They didn't have any sort of like buffer pay or anything at that point. And, uh, and so it was a point of concern for, for a lot of the players, and they didn't really know if this was the right thing to do or not. Uh, eventually, they decided, yeah, you know what? Unanimously, they met up, and they said, this is the right thing to do. This is what we need to do. So on April 1st, uh, 1972, they went on a 13-day strike. Um, and eventually, after, the 13, after 13 days of no games, it was like 58 games or something like that, um, the, the, the owners caved in and they negotiated for better pensions and they got exactly what they wanted. They got what they were talking about, right? Now, this happened again in 1994, but, but that, the, the 1994 strike went on for a lot longer than just 13 days, right? The owners were not willing to, to budge on what they wanted, which means that the capacity for greed had just increased in 22 years. That's really all that means. What the owners were saying, because everything was up to be um, renegotiated at that point, right? Everything was coming up for re renegotiation. So the owners were saying that they were going to cap salaries for the players. Of course, they're not going to cap salaries for anybody in the executive board. Um, they were also going to take a percentage from uh, licensing agreements uh, of, of players' likenesses. Right. So they were literally uh, not just seizing the means of productions from these baseball players, but they were also seizing the means of the baseball players face itself. They were just, they were taking their face. It's like the worst version of face off ever. So. <laughs> so they went on strike for this in 1994. They were just like, now nah, we're done. Um this is crazy. You're, th th we're we're going to see exponential pay cuts as as players, and you guys are going to get exponentially richer, and we're not we're not even going to get to be able to keep our own face, you know. And in this era of Facebook, you know, uh, if if these baseball players would would make a a, a Facebook page, they I'd be, the owners would have control over that. They they you know. So, what if one of them? Uh, wanted to change genders or something. If there's ownership of the face, the face is going to change too. That's good. That's a that's an even bigger problem that these owners didn't even consider. And again, the owners were like, we didn't even expect that they would go on strike for this stuff. They thought that enriching us would just be the best thing to do for everybody, you know, because because you know how everybody needs to worship me as as though I am a god because I own a baseball team. So. By the end of 1994, uh, fans were getting restless because they had to, like, pay attention to, you know, like, the, the world and stuff. And it got so bad <laughs> that in 1994, President Clinton, Bill Clinton, you guys remember Bill, uh, Bill Clinton, they, he came out and made a press conference and said that this has gone on long enough uh, and, that, uh, and that the players... And the owners need to sort their shit out. And I think that's fucking hilarious that when America's pastime goes on strike, the establishment freaks out because they're like, holy shit, they are not distracted anymore. Nobody is distracted. They're all paying attention to what we're doing. We need to we need to get them back. Let, let's just yell it. Just fucking get back out there and throw the fucking ball around. So some so some average suburbanite can get shit-faced before fighting with his neighbor over, you know, how close the tire tread on his car is leaning into his driveway. That's what we need to do with America. And and now they're, now they're getting in the way of us telling gay people they can't work. This is crazy, because remember, it's 1994. So that didn't really work. Uh, they, the, Bill Clinton gave him a deadline to like February 95 and, uh, and the, the date went and passed and the, the owners of these teams were not ready to negotiate. They were not willing to talk to the players or any of this sort of stuff, right? 
So it just didn't work. And uh, so things were getting a little bit more desperate. And they finally took it to court. And the courts decided that the owners, by refusing to negotiate, by um, not uh, collectively bargaining with the players, are, the, are responsible for the strike, are the reasons why the strike is going. Uh, and, uh, and so they had to come in and renegotiate the contracts, which they did. Uh, but this had pretty pretty drastic effects on on the teams. I think like the Montreal Expo, w- w- who was like a winning team at that time, uh, had to leave Montreal. Um, and really, it also had a, a major effect on fans because the, because there were a couple of fan there was there was a bunch of fans that particularly didn't like the fact that there was a strike happening. They didn't like the fact that. Uh, you know, they, they didn't get to get drunk on a weekday and uh, watch some people throw the ball around, you know. They didn't, they didn't like the, the fact that they didn't have a distraction and actually had to pay attention to, to the, 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 the articles of legislation that were going to determine their future. This trend of complacency has been going on in America for a very long time. Uh, People lost people lost faith in the game at that point too, um, and I don't. I from from what I from what I read, they, they haven't really um, been able to recover from it, which is kind of sad, um, you know. But I mean, the players stood up for what they needed, and uh, and it sucks that the that there was a, a, a portion of fans that didn't stick by the players, um, and and really, I mean, if you're a true fan of the game, if you're a true fan of of baseball or, or any of these, any of the, like, even if this happened at the NBA, even if this happened at the, in hockey or whatever, I, I think if you're a true fan of the game, if you're a true fan of, of a team, then you should stick by your, by the players, not the owners, because the, because in that context, the players have more in co- uh, common with you than the owners do. So it kind of sucks that the fans weren't, you know, kind of on their side. But I think the players did the right thing. I think the players should should continue to fight for, you know, things that they believe in, things that um, things that they know are right. Um, And uh, I mean, again, it's like if baseball can do it, if baseball can can if these baseball players can go out and be like, yo, we need uh, collective bargaining rights. We we should be represented accurately. We should be compensated accurately. You can't take a, a major percentage of our likeness. You can't just take our face and put a dollar sign on it. That's our face, and and that's their right to do. And they sh- and they damn well should. And I think the I think fans, if you're true fans, you should support your players, just like you should support striking workers. Uh, you know, if you're fans of like, uh, like groceries, like if you're like a big fan of like groceries, then you should support the Whole Foods strikers. You should support if, 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 a, uh, if, if Trader Joe's employees decide to go on strike, you should, you should support them. If you're a fan of, uh, you, you know, fucking two day shipping from Amazon to, to get your chutch keys or whatever the fuck, then you should be in solidarity with the Amazon striker. If you're a big fan of having your garbage picked up, you should stand in solidarity with sanitation workers when they ask for protective gear during a global pandemic. You shouldn't sit there and say, hazard pay, how dare they? Are you a fan of getting shit during the time when there's a global pandemic and a lot of people don't have work and are struggling to get by and there are people trying to do their job and help people out are you a fan of eating then you should support your your fucking working class people all right onwards onwards and upwards we're moving right along we're chugging along this this video here today guys uh feeling good about the pace let's see if this uh this this <laughs> takes me down to an angry ranty road uh so this story was sent to me by my friend mark viola i was kind of waiting for something like this to happen actually um it's a story about india 
and I was concerned about India throughout this whole pandemic situation. And, and Mark and I had a conversation and I remembered they do have a version of uh, a, a version of Medicare for all in India. Uh, Prime Minister Modi does have that, but, but it's executed in the same fashion as the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, so it's like you have to go sign up for it. So it's kind of like Medicare for all. The principles are like Medicare for all, but it's not Medicare for all. A little bit complicated. Uh, but uh, India is not hit as hard right now by it, uh, but they are taking early precautionary measures, right? Um, they're locking everything down. They're going into quarantine. And I think the next step, if they do it right, should be converting some uh, facilities into testing and treatment centers specifically for COVID-19, very similarly to what we saw uh, in the uh, in the Pacific South Southwest, uh, is that Southwest? Like the Korea, Vietnam, China area, uh, Japan, all the all those countries. Is that Pacific South Southwest? Somebody comment if that's what it is. I, I'm I'm getting my geography wrong here, but anyway, um, so they went on lockdown, and what ended up happening with that is they put a transform transportation lockdown as well. They told everybody to stay inside, and, and they basically shut down all the transportation um, around as well. And uh, that caused a bunch of migrant workers. These are people that come in from villages to the big cities to work at jobs. And they, they'll usually live in the cities. You know, they'll kind of either live in these shanty towns or they'll live in a very cheap little uh, apartment space or cohabitation space or what, whatever. Um, and, they, and they'll work, and then they'll send money back to their, to their family so that their, their family can, you know, to live um that's that's one of the ways that that the, that these people work so a lot of the business there is done by uh cash by the way right it's like a cash industry um so all these migrant workers that are in these big cities that are ordered to go back to their homes uh are left without transportation they can't go back to their villages so what do they do they start walking they, they're, they're, and they're walking like 50 to 300 miles. That's how far away some of these people are, 300 miles. They have to walk 300 miles. And the crazy part is <laughs> the Modi government was basically like, oh, we didn't realize the, the scope of the exodus that was going to happen when we like announced this lockdown uh, that everybody needs to be inside. Like We didn't realize the scope of which this thing that we're asking people to do. Like, we didn't realize that it was going to be this fucking crazy. Like, we didn't get that part. Uh, which, to me, is just like, but, but how? But how did you not know that? Like, how did you not... Have you never met people? Like, when you kind of hurt... Like, there's also a 1. What, 1.3 billion people in India right now? <laughs> like, you don't think, like a, like, a lockdown order isn't going to panic all these people? Like, what the... What? But this is no different than how the United States reacted um, when they put their cor their their quarantine uh, you know orders in effect. Um, very similar to the United States Congress, they were just like, "Oh, we didn't realize that we were gonna sh kind of shut down the economy because we just figured that the economy was uh, run by uh, magic pixies." that uh that rich people um in, uh made with um with stock exchanges that's so when you make the exchange these pixies are born and uh and they kind of run the gears of the economy uh we didn't realize that uh it it's it's actually uh, determined on 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 middle class people and we just kept bailing out the banks but we didn't realize that nobody believed in the banks because because the banks aren't really doing anything and people are out of work and can't invest in the banks. So whoopsie, like that's, <laughs> which really to me shows how out of touch these fucking politicians are, right? Like how out of touch these people are to be like, oh, we didn't realize like all of these jobs would be affected by it. We also didn't realize how these other jobs that are essential are going to be affected when we say quarantine, global pandemic, and all these other words that sound very, very scary, like it just shows them that they're not in touch with with what everyday people go through, and they want to represent everyday people.
Like, how are you going to represent an everyday person when you don't know what an everyday person has to go through? So if they would have done these lockdown procedures properly, um, I think what they would have done is provide, like, make sure that there's some kind of transport for them and make sure that if you can't afford the transportation, uh, that some, somebody or something is going to take care of you. Right. Like to, so to have some sort of provisionary budget within allocated within the transportation department um, to get these people home so that they can be with their families in lockdown. Right. Now, right now in India, um, and like I said, these numbers are, are probably uh, going to change. Uh, there's only 1000 reported COVID-19 cases and 27 deaths um, in a country of 1.3 billion. That is a. To me, that that sounds like a fucking miracle. Um, with what's going on in New York <laughs> and and India being far more densely populated than New York, it's way more dense, uh, densely populated than New York. Um, that just either means that uh, uh, Indian people have superior genetics; they were just, you know, far more resilient. Uh, to to these viruses um or uh, we're cleaner than new york and but in either case it's just it just kind of shows like a lack of uh lack of proper execution in terms of america's part of letting this disease spread because i i think india is sort of in the earlier stages is is my understanding of it. I might be wrong about it, but they, but they seem to be in the earlier stages of it. So they're immediately locking shit down um, to try to try to do the quarantine social distancing thing. Now, the concern I have with this is that I feel like these numbers are going to go up, not because of um, the virus, but because of starvation and exhaustion from migrant workers literally having to walk back to their homes 50 to 300 miles and there are people that are that are trying to do that right that right right now they don't have money for food they don't have water they're exhausted but they got to get home because there's this order in place um there's this lockdown order in place and a lot of them are like smoking to curb their appetite and uh we're dealing with an upper respiratory disease which means that smokers are more are, are more likely to be susceptible to this thing or like if it hits them it'll hit them a little bit harder than a non-smoker would at that time and you also have a, a group of people that are exhausted that are starving that are stressed out which which also means that they're so essentially by creating a lockdown order and not executing it properly you created a bunch of fucking immunocompromised people you've just made that happen you just made people that are far more susceptible and far more likely to get this virus that aren't going to uh, that aren't going to be able to fight it off as as well as as anybody else would so that i think is going to create more deaths than the virus itself And this is this is a problem that I think Modi has had for for quite some time is that he comes up with these ideas, right? Like the lockdown order, hitting that lockdown early, getting that quarantine in place early, getting that stay at home order in place as early as possible um, is essential, is essential in in, um, you know, in all this in in a, in, a, in this situation. Uh, we should have caught it a month early when there was uh, reports of this virus spreading. That's what we should have done, right? Um, and going into the whole shoulda, coulda, woulda is at this point, uh, I don't know how much productivity that's really going to get, how, how much we're going to really move ahead, move forward uh, in, in really taking care of this um, situation. Uh, you know, that's why yesterday I said we should be correcting the curve. That's the point of that. We should be looking ahead to, to say, okay, we fucked up. We made some mistakes. How do we fix it? How do we get to a point where we can actually reignite the economy and get the middle class taken care of? Um, and that's not really that's not really happening either. The situation's kind of getting worse. So, so with India, it seems like they took care of this. This was an early measure that they took. 
and they took care of it, uh, and, and that's why they're doing this lockdown order. But the problem with Modi is he has these ideas, he gets up on the right track, and then he does a real shit job of executing it. You know, like he wanted to, one of the, one of the best examples of that is he wanted to take care of um, organized crime. And organized crime being a cash-based economy, he was like, oh, I'll curtail the cash. That's what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll curtail the cash. And so he took out 500 and 1,000 rupee notes uh, out of circulation. And he basically said, if you have those notes, you basically have this amount of time to get it into a bank. And India is a primarily cash-based economy. So not a lot of people, I mean, you know, not everybody has a bank account. Poor people don't really have a bank account in India. That's not something that they need, especially if everything runs on cash anyway. So again, it's one of those things where poor people kind of look at like the stock market of any kind of thing, like playing the, playing the market, buying stocks and all that stuff. They're like, fucking why? Why would I put my money into this thing that's going to grind it up and somehow magically maybe spit out more money? I don't know. That sounds like gambling. I don't have any time for that. I got to fucking buy food for my kids. You know, like they just kind of look at it that way. So they weren't, they, people weren't able to get to a bank and lost a shit ton of money because he did this. And then organized crime was able to get their money and launder it through the banking system. So it, like, it, it kind of failed. Like, I understand what he was trying to do. It's just he didn't execute it properly. And this is sort of the same thing. He, he ordered this lockdown and he put this time frame on it and everybody fucking freaked out where it should have been like, hey, we're going to take a week to get everybody home. We're going to take care of the migrant workers that are in the cities. Um, so if everybody within the city, if you live in the city, if that's, if the, you know, that's where your family is and stuff, if you guys could go ahead and stay quarantined and only go out for essential things like groceries and things of that, things of that nature, um, we're going to try to organize to try to get these people back to their villages um, and, and come up with a plan and a system and, you know, like take care of hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, but he didn't do that. Um, really the task is, and, and, and this is a pretty big, and what I'm asking is, is a pretty big task. I, I completely understand that, but that's what the infrastructure I think should have been rerouted to. And you still have the opportunity to, I think, do that in, in some respects. Uh, there needs to be uh, another provision put into place to help the displaced and the homeless. Um, India has a lot of shanty towns as well. And, uh, and those folks, I mean, you know, an infection like this could run really rampant there, um, which then could erupt and become worse. So you kind of have to figure out how to keep, protect these folks as well in order to protect the larger populace in general. And, and, and just because you, you also should right like you should value their life as much as you value mine or, or yours um, they did announce that they were putting 22 billion dollars 22 billion dollars not rupees dollars into a relief package uh, focused on people that were displaced by the virus so so basically a, a, a 22 billion dollar economic stimulus to help the working class people of India that's the plan right now um, and the the main thing I think that, that they still need to do, and, and that's, that's a good thing. And they're, again, they're doing, it, they're doing it a lot faster if, if they are kind of in the earlier stages of this thing. Um, if they're a couple weeks behind us, uh, there has to be a plan that's put into place for more vulnerable people in the community. There has to be. You can't have people that are homeless and displaced. You can't have these migrant workers that are all based in a cash society and not take care of them and just say, we're in a lockdown. And if you don't go home, we're going to fine you or we're going to put you in prison or whatever. That, that's, that's not a way to, um, that's, that's, not a, that's not a way to lead. That's not a solution to this. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm hoping for the, I'm hoping that these people get home safe in some capacity, that that the Modi government comes up with some kind of a plan to take care of these migrant workers. Um, I hope that this $22 billion economic stimulus that is going to come out um, does take these people into account, that, that poor people are taken into account in India.
so we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that this, this bit of bad news will get turned around, uh, and, and we'll see some, we'll see some action. We'll see some real, real planning, uh, going forward. So, all right. Um, we got a rare treat. We have a, we have a fourth story today, you guys, fourth story today. Uh, and, uh, Let's switch right over to it. It is the 10 year anniversary of the collateral murder video that Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning so bravely revealed to us 10 years ago, showing that the American military is murdering children and civilians and journalists in Iraq. Guys, we did it 10 years, 10 years. Cue up, cue up the celebratory graphics. Is there, do we have, we don't, we don't have uh celebratory graphics to be excited about the collateral murder video uh yeah it's it's the 10 year 10 years ago julian assange and chelsea manning revealed to us that the american military was firing upon civilians children and journalists in a uh, non-active war zone uh in iraq um and it's a pretty chilling video if you have not seen it. I have seen it numerous times. I've seen the other footage that has been released as well. Um, it's fucking heartbreaking. It's uh, horrific. And uh, all those people have uh, not been committed of war crimes. Julian Assange, on the other hand, is still in Belmarsh prison during a fucking global pandemic. A guy that that has a bunch of health problems because he was cooped up in the Ecuadorian embassy, spied on constantly, had no level of privacy for seven years, has depression, has uh, a, a, a cardiac condition, has dental problems, is immunocompromised, is in a prison after he has served out his time. Why? Because America said so. Because he revealed the war crimes of the elites he revealed that America was committing war crimes. He revealed that, globally speaking, all of the elites have been committing corporate crimes, that, that they've been exploiting a bunch of people, and they knew that they were exploiting a bunch of people, and they, they were... That's kind of what they said. <laughs> Where, what, what, the, what, he did, what he revealed, this has become the iconic thing that has come out of um, the, the war in Iraq is that we were doing stuff like this, that America was doing stuff like this, right? And, and where that specific shooting happened was not part of a war zone. It was, a, it was like a suburban neighborhood. It would be like if troops showed up here and started firing on all the old biddies that walk around my parents' apartment. And then basically we're just like, oh, collateral damage, collateral damage. It's not a big deal, guys. Don't worry about it. That's just kind of the shit that happens, you know? That's just kind of the shit that happens. What, why were those old women there? They shouldn't have been there. Didn't they know that if they set foot outside their house that an Apache helicopter could just fire upon them randomly? That's just what, what's just what happens? We're in a war, okay, constantly, all the time, because, ter because we're going to say terrorism and maybe Russia. The defense is, and that's exactly what the defense is too. The defense is basically that uh, that this is this is part of war. This is part of the rules of engagement, uh, which is funny. It's just I just I just never realized that the rules of engagement involved murder. Um, that's just you know goofy old me didn't fucking get that. And they came out and they were like, listen, this is just one part of the story. You are not getting the full picture, and they are absolutely right, you guys. We are not getting the full picture because the children that are murdered uh, by the American troops will never get to tell their part of the story. So in that, there you go. I didn't think it was going to happen, but here we are. I'm agreeing with the American military right there. We are not getting the full story because the people that the American military murdered will, uh, will never get to tell their side of the story. And this wasn't an isolated incident. That was, that was the other thing that we... Um, that we saw, right? Like, is is this happened everywhere? Uh, the collateral murder video specifically, um, you know, what it shows is people trying to escape. They were trying to run, and they were trying to like cover each other up so that uh, 
parents were covering their children. And there, and then there was like a rescue attempt um, where there was a van, and then they fired in the van. Uh, and the, the, the current editor-in-chief of, of WikiLeaks spoke out uh, and, and gave some details. The Apache has hollow point bullets that are big enough that they can like bust through a tank. And the hollow point, too, is when they make contact with something, they, they explode, they break apart. That's, that's supposed to be used on, that's like high, uh, like it's supposed, like heavy duty combat is what it's supposed to be used for. And, uh, and they were using that on civilians. Uh, there was another uh, video that where Hellfire missiles were used in a civilian neighborhood. Like they can see a person walking across and they still fired the missile. Um, destroyed the apartment. And there's people that like describe having to carry their loved ones' bodies out. All these people are not in prison. All these people get to walk free. They're awarded medals. They're they're claimed to be, you know, heroes. Um, and the person that revealed this to us, that the American military was ordered and did fire upon civilians and journalists and kids and is just calling them collateral damage and is excusing the death of these people. Um, Julian Assange is in prison. Chelsea Manning was in prison. She got out, thank God. Um, she, but, and, and, you know, even that, that was kind of great in, in the sense of uh, she was fined. She was fined like $1,000 a day and they basically wanted, to, wanted them to, uh, wanted Chelsea to, to say that she was coerced by Julian Assange and forced into uh, revealing the uh, footage. And she kept saying, no, I, I wanted to reveal it because I thought it was wrong. And she, she stood for what she believed in and they punished her for it by keeping her in prison um, and then charging her a fee. And then we had a GoFundMe, right? Like, like they set up a GoFundMe and people donated to it. And, uh, and she, and basically were able to pay off that fee, the prison fee. So that's cool. We came together in solidarity and fucking helped out a real hero. Uh, and you know, the people that reveal these crimes go to prison. The people that commit these crimes, uh, get medals of honor. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what 10 years has revealed to us. Um, Ten years has basically revealed that the uh, the justice system under an empire is unjust. Uh, and if you're going to get, if you're going to scream fascism, 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 it's been here. It's just masked itself as a democracy, and uh, and we can fight back against it. And we are the people that support Julian Assange, the people that stand up for the fight, the people that support Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning and Danny Everett, Everett Hale, and Reality Winner, and uh, Daniel Ellsberg, and all of the whistleblowers that have come out. The people that support them, stand in solidarity with them, um, call them heroes. We're fighting back against that. This is what we're doing. All right, guys, that is the, that's the whole video, I think. That's the video, that's the whole episode today. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I th I, get, I think today was a little bit more intense, huh? Uh, uh, <laughs> I gotta pick some pretty intense things to talk about today. I usually try to I don't know try to lighten things up a little bit, but I guess uh, that 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 wasn't the case. Uh, that's okay. Um, I, I hope you guys got something out of it. I hope you guys uh, if you guys like this stuff, please share it with 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 groups, with your friends, with your enemies, with whoever you think is going to need something like this um, or would or would find value in something like this, maybe maybe needs a different perspective or something like that. Um, this sort of stuff doesn't really get shown to as many people. Um, you know, it does get suppressed. It, it does get uh, it, it does get ranked lower by the algorithm on on Facebook and YouTube so um, it's really up to you guys if you guys enjoy this stuff please share it um, I share this out to as many groups and stuff as I can um, but I'm just one person 
and uh, I can only do so much. And I can also, I, I also get flagged sometimes and, and they say it's spam and I'm not a person. And, you know, it's just like the algorithm is questioning my reality, which is a whole mind fuck in and of itself. Um, but, uh, yeah. And, uh, and if you have the ability to, um, and, and you want to donate to this, you, you can do that over at ramen noodles, comedy.com slash donate. Uh, that's R A M A N noodles, comedy.com slash donate. Um, I have some more stories coming up tomorrow. I will be continuing my series where I will be talking about, uh, some strikes, um, I'm, I've got a story about Zoom uh, lined up because I've been talking about trying to do a, 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 a Zoom live stand-up comedy show, and I want to see what they're saying about some of their encryption problems. Um, and uh, Fight fight for the Future just actually sent out an email about that too. So uh, I might have to find some kind of an alternative, and I think, I, I think there might be one that somebody recommended to me. Um, and when I was on the Action for Assange show um, uh, maybe a week and a half ago, they used something similar to Zoom that wasn't Zoom but had very similar interfaces. So I might, uh, I might try to look into that as well. My album will be coming out. I haven't decided on release date yet. It's, it's like 70% there. It's like 70% there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do something special with it on the Bandcamp end uh, and, uh, and, and maybe have two different versions of the album out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's why I'm saying 70%. I have to work on that second part. Uh, and, and I've got some video clips and stuff that I'll be releasing once I figure out when I'm, gonna be, when I'm actually going to be putting the, the damn thing out. Um, so um, thank you for being patient and being supportive and watching this stuff. It really means a lot, uh, that you guys, you guys tune in, you guys pay attention. Um, thank you to people that tune into the live streams on Sundays too. Uh, that's, that's super awesome. I, I, it makes me feel good to, to, to communicate with you guys, uh, on, you know, on, uh, in live and all that stuff. Um, so I'm going to keep, keep doing those. Uh, again, Philosophy Friday, we got Storytelling Saturday, I go live on, on Sundays, Thursdays will be my day off to try to really hone into writing and focusing on my other podcast, Taboo Table Talk. Um, so those are, that's basically how I'm doing things moving forward. Uh, other than that, you know, keep an eye on things. I'm not sure when we're going to get back to doing live performances. I'm probably due to lose a few more weeks of of work, um, and I don't know when we're gonna get back to to booking. Right now, I'm trying to figure. Hopefully, b within the summer, you know, August, September, that sort of stuff, we'll be back into um, booking and 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 all that sort. Of, hopefully, b well before that, we'll be back to doing, y you know, the regular things that we we would be doing. But just with the with the knowledge. Um, that this system doesn't really work for us and what, it, what we really have to do is support each other within the community um, and, and uh, stay in solidarity with each other. Hopefully that's how we decide to move forward instead of buying into a system that has never given a shit about us, that has never cared about us. Uh, so, um, yeah, with that, uh, <laughs> uh, with, with that in mind, um, I'm, I'm a little fired up, so I'm going to go and... and, and unwind and relax for a bit. I hope you guys are going to be doing the same, but till tomorrow, we'll see you in the road. Bye.